Isaiah 53, reading from the Old Testament. And I'll make reference to the New Testament as well, um, because this is also shared not in detail as Isaiah 53, but it is made reference to in John chapter 12, as well as Romans chapter 10. Okay, so let's begin here. Again, I say it all the time, and I continue to say it. I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. That's my preferred version. So. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground, he shall, or he hath no form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, verse 4, he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed and peter also writes by his stripes, past tense, we are healed. This is more looking forward with his stripes or present. With his stripes, we are healed. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Verse 11. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. 
Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressor. Isaiah chapter 53. Here in Isaiah chapter 53, let me point out before I get into the actual message of it all. There are many scriptures, this makes reference to many scriptures that we read in the New Testament. The New Testament makes many uh, references to this particular chapter of Isaiah. This was a prophecy of, of God that he gave to Isaiah to deliver. And it was the foretelling, that's what prophecy is, prophecy with the C, C, Y at the end. It was a foretelling of the death, burial, or actually the crucifixion, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. More so the crucifixion and uh, of Christ, Jesus, our Savior. So the New Testament references this account, this report. And that's what a report is, an account. So I would like to speak to you this morning about truth be told truth be told that statement that perhaps many of us were exposed to as kids and many of us used uh, through the entirety of our lives up to up to date truth be told or tell the truth tell the truth concerning that account tell the truth concerning that story Tell the truth concerning that report. Truth be told. And again, the second part, the most important question ever asked. Again, that's a more so a biased statement, my statement, the most important question ever asked. Well, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 23, the Bible says to, Proverbs 23, 23, the Bible says to buy the truth and sell it not. Purchase the truth and sell it not. Obtain the truth and hold on to it. In order for the truth to be told, one must acquire the truth. One must have the truth in order to tell it. Here in this Bible reading in Isaiah 53, verse 1, he asked the question, Who hath believed our report? Who hath believed our account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race? Who hath believed this report, this account? Also in John chapter 12, verse 38, he repeats these words. Who hath believed our report? Also Paul writing in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, he repeats it and he says, Who hath believed our report? So as we read, as I read this and as I think about it, I come to the conclusion that this is really being emphasized. Who hath believed this report, this account of Jesus Christ? It is God's, it is a question from God to man. A question from God to man. Who hath believed this report? Who hath believed our report? Let the truth be told. The Bible tells us 
the Bible instructs us to do what? Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Excuse me just a moment. Let me adjust this here. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. My question, even before I get into the meat and potatoes of this, is what is truth? What is truth? I believe that we have God's truth, which is the Word of God, contained in the Holy Scriptures, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 14, Verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father, no man can come to heaven, except it's through me. That's the truth. And Jesus let the truth be told. So that's God's truth. And God's truth is contained in the word of God which he has given us, 66 books that we call the Holy Bible. And then we have our truth. Again, God's truth is always right. God's truth is always accurate. God's truth is always fitting and applicable for that moment, for that time, for that period, for that space in one's life. God's truth provides comfort, provides consolation, provides answers for our lives. But then we have our truth, man's truth, the individual's truth. And I'm just going to generalize this by making this statement. Our truth, I believe, my biased opinion, our truth at times is based on knowledge that we've obtained, be it through reading or hearing, we've obtained this knowledge. Our truth is based on knowledge that we've obtained, our experiences that we have lived, our emotions that we're feeling at that particular time or experiencing at that particular time and also I believe depending on the person that we're relating it to that we're speaking to that we're talking to so our truth we have a truth which is comes out in the form of an opinion statements ideologies theories but our truth, man's truth, when I say our truth, man's truth could be inaccurate. It's not always right. Because again, at times, it is governed, it is dictated by the way one's feeling, one's emotional uh, status at the time, the way uh, our perception or outlook of a situation or circumstances depending on the individual, uh, our relationship with the individual that's uh, going through that situation or circumstance. So our truth may be tainted at times. And let me refer to now the, in the Christian community. In the Christian community, we often quote and make reference to Ephesians chapter 4. Speak the truth in love. So the question goes back to whose truth are you going to speak in love? You're going to speak God's truth, which we find in the Word of God, or are we going to speak our truth, which can be dictated and governed by us? Our knowledge, our experience, the way we feel about that particular topic, subject, person. So that's a question that I believe we have to ask ourselves. And I say that because in my experience, I've heard P 
people within the Christian community say, well, God wouldn't want that, or God wouldn't want this, or God wouldn't, and I'm thinking, that's their truth based on what they think God would want, based on what they think God, which is dictated possibly by their emotions, unless you have some scriptures where you can back it up. So I just bring all that out to just share when we talk about truth be told, what truth are we referring to? God's or ours? Now, our truth should, can, and should be in alignment with God's truth, especially as Christians. But I realize that as human beings living in this earthly temple, that we have some frailties. And at times, our truth, our reasoning, doesn't always find itself in alignment with God's word, which God's word is the truth. And Jesus said about God's word, about the truth, he said, know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So, truth be told, it must be God's truth that is told in order to make and set men and women free, not our truth. It has been said, let me share something with you that was shared with me years ago. It's been shared that the greatest enemy that we have in life, that a person can have in life, is the one who knows the truth and will not tell them. I want you to think about that for just a moment. The greatest enemy that I have, I can ask, just pick a Christian or ask myself in times past, who's the greatest enemy you have? The devil. Well, we know he's the enemy. Jesus identified him as the enemy of our souls, and therefore Jesus went and died on the cross and nailed principalities on his cross, as the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3. So he's already been identified, recognized, and it's been acknowledged that he is the enemy of the human race, the enemy of God, the enemy of man. But let's look at this. The greatest enemy we have, as we navigate life every day, is the one who knows the truth. Not their truth, God's truth. Who knows God's truth and fails to tell you. Possibly because of their relationship with you. Or your relationship with them. Possibly because you don't want to hurt one's feelings or they don't want to hurt your feelings. You don't want to hurt their feelings. So we let people go on and exist knowing the truth, knowing the inevitable consequences of the path that they're taking. But because we want to protect their feelings, their emotions, we either don't share the truth, we don't speak the truth in love, or we just let them go about and pray God work it out. When God may be telling us, speak the truth and speak it in love. Speak my truth and speak it in love so that they may be made free. So these are just a few questions before I get into Isaiah chapter 53 questions that were on my heart, not just recently, but all the time, actually, uh, the truth, the truth, because we want to protect people's feelings, we want to protect our feelings, we want to protect relationships, and all this, and I wonder at times if that hinders the Christian believer from speaking the truth in love, even though as kids, as youth, Growing up, we were exposed to and we were told to truth be told or tell the truth anyhow, right? All these different sayings. So let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 53. 
Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible reads in verse 1, he says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So again, the word report is defined as account. Who hath believed our account? Now here Isaiah is getting ready to do what? God is doing what? Through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is getting ready to prophesy. As God, the Holy Spirit, inspires him. And he's going to let the truth be told concerning this report, this account of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So truth be told concerning Jesus Christ. So who hath believed our report? And let me dive into the second part of this message in the question form. The most important question ever asked. So even before I move forward, I was thinking about this and contemplating before putting this in here and even sharing it. The most important question asked within the Christian community for those of us who are believers, who are saved, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves I find myself asking the question to individuals in the past and even in the present, are you saved? The question I'm asking them is, are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And maybe some of you, and that's not a wrong question to ask. Those are not wrong questions to ask because we read in the Bible uh, in Acts chapter 16, Paul addressed the Philippian jailer. So those questions are pertinent questions. Those are good questions. But as I think about it, and as I read Isaiah chapter 53, especially verse 1, and how he shared it in John chapter 12, verse 38, and also Romans chapter 6, the question, who hath believed our report? I really began to think about What's the most important question? Is it to ask someone, are they saved? Is it to ask someone, do they know Jesus? Or is it, is the most important question, do you know the report? Do you know the account of Jesus? And let me just prioritize this, how I prioritize it in my mind as I present it to you. For me, at this point, that is the most important question. Have you or do you believe the report? Do you believe the account? Do you believe the story of all that Jesus Christ went through? Because if I can't get you to believe, if I find out you don't believe that Jesus was crucified, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus died and that he was buried and that he resurrected, why am I asking you, are you saved? Because we're only saved as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So if, I, if I'm asking a person, are they saved, and fail to ask them, do they believe the report, it could be contradictory to a degree or it could be a contrast. So for me, the most important question as laid out by Isaiah is, do you believe the report? Because if you believe the report, now we can go on and ask you, if you believe the report, are you saved? Have you received this Christ? Have you received Jesus? You believe that he was crucified. You believe that he died. You believe that he was buried. You believe that he resurrected. You believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now that I know that you believe that, let me pose the question to you. Do you know him as your personal savior? 
Are ye saved? Let's go back to Isaiah here and let's just look at the account. So when we're bringing, when we're evangelizing, when we're talking to family members, as we approach them and as we have conversations with them, yes, we want to ask, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Excellent question. Uh, good question. C question of compassion, right? C question of concern. Are you saved? Good question. Wonderful question. Be moved with compassion. But I challenge you and I challenge myself, I challenge us. Can we look at it and go down as it's shared a little deeper? Can we go down and look at the foundation of salvation and knowing Jesus? So Isaiah brings it out. And unlike any other chapter in the Bible, we have... Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. So important it was to describe this report and describe this account in detail that Jesus made reference to it in John chapter 12. And Paul made reference to it in Romans chapter 10. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Because I believe the most important question that's ever asked to an individual is, do you believe in what Jesus did for you? Well, like the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, he was reading this particular chapter. And he says, I need someone to explain it to me. If I can get someone to explain it to me, and enlighten me to what the prophet was saying, then I can believe it. So Philip, the evangelist, he began to explain it in Acts chapter 8. He began to explain to the Ethiopian eunuch Isaiah 53. Let's look at it. Isaiah 53 verse 1, he says, Who hath believed our report? I find it quite interesting to start off a chapter with a question such as this. Who have believed this account that I'm getting ready to describe to you? It's because this account mankind has hope. It's because this account that we have John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What does that mean as we share John 3.16 to individuals? In their mind, in their heart, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Could you go into depth? Could you explain that to me? I believe that's where we take men and women back to Isaiah chapter 53, where the question is, do you believe in this report? Do you believe in this account that I'm getting ready to describe to you. It's more than about religion. It's more than about church anity. It's more uh, about than just going through the motions of serving God or Allah or deity. Let's look at the report because I believe it's the report and it's the account that brings people to the place where they recognize and they realize how much God really loves them how much God really cares about them, of all the things that we see that Jesus went through, it describes the love of God to us. So he asked the question, who hath believed this report? This report, and he goes into it, he says in verse 2, the report, the account, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, is starting to describe. It's starting to describe in verse two, how Jesus looked after they beat him, after the whips ripped his flesh. He says here, he had no form. They had beaten him to such a degree that he was almost unrecognizable 
to his own mother. The stripes on his back, on his arms, on his face, the thorns on his head, the blood dripping down. He had no form, no comeliness. And he goes on and he says, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is the Son of God. This is the one who's without sin. And yet when we look upon him, there is no beauty, no form, no comeliness. Just a mass of body. This is the account. This is the story when we're asking men and women, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? Do you know this about Jesus? Do you know that this is what Jesus went through and this is what Jesus did for us? Going on in verse 3, it talks about his treatment. He is despised and rejected of men. So not only was he beaten by men, no, not only was he unrecognizable to men, he was despised and he was rejected by men and women. God has never rejected you and I. But yet mankind rejected Jesus Christ. I'm talking about let the truth be told. Not just asking questions, do you know Jesus? Not just asking the question, are you saved? Let the entire truth be told of the account of Jesus and all that he went through so that we could be saved, so that we could come to know him as a personal Lord and Savior. His treatment. The Creator's treatment from His creation. He was despised and He was rejected by His creation. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And as we hid our faces from Him, and, at, and we hid as it were our faces, we turned our faces. Again, rejection. We didn't want to see him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now this is the son of God. This is the miracle worker. This is the one who's bringing hope, have words of hope, words of comfort, words of, of, of truth, words of deliverance. And we didn't want to hear him. We rejected him. We despised him. Let the truth be told. Let the truth be told in detail how Jesus was treated by mankind. How the creator was treated by his creation. Verse 4, this is what he did for us. Let the truth be told. He hath borne our griefs. And he has carried our sorrows. So the Bible tells us in verse 3 that he was a man of sorrows. Whose sorrows? Our sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. Whose grief? Our grief. Verse 4, what did he do for us? He bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, was upon him on the cross. Our sorrows were on him. Our griefs were on him. Our iniquities were on him. And by his stripes, his stripes, those bloody stripes, his flesh peeling off. It was for our healing. It was so that we could be spiritually healed, so that we can be mentally healed, and so that we can be physically healed, brothers and sisters. Let the truth be told. Not just glossing over the Bible, not just 
glossing it over by church entity and going through the motions and just having a church experience and dancing and shouting and being entertained. Let the truth be told about what Jesus went through and what Jesus experienced and what Jesus carried for you and I. I truly believe more men and women will be saved. More men, more children would come to God. We ask the question, I'm not trying to get off topic, I'll get right back on the scriptures here. We ask, why aren't young people being saved? Are we telling them the truth? Why aren't young people uh, coming to church anymore? Are we telling them the truth? Or are we trying to set up systems and events to entertain? And then say, are you saved? Saved from what? Why do I need to be saved? Yes, the sin factor. But let's tell them about Jesus. Let's tell them the truth about what Jesus went through. So that when we talk about John 3.16, it makes sense for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son to bear our griefs. He gave his only begotten son to bear our sorrows. He gave his only begotten son to bear our iniquities. He gave his only begotten son so that he would become our propitiation, our substitute so that you and I wouldn't have to die lost and go to hell without hope Jesus went and he took our place let the truth be told let the truth be told what's the most important question ever asked for me as I read as I study you may differ and that is fine that is okay but the, great, the most important question asked is, do you believe the report? Do you believe this account that Isaiah describes here? God brought it up. Jesus brought it up. Paul brought it up. Let's go on. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. Some may believe they're healed by the doctors of today, healed by the medicine of today. Let the truth be told, we are healed because of Jesus. In the mental health community, they're healed because of counseling. Some may believe they're healed because of counseling and therapy. Let the truth be told, they're healed because of Jesus. This is what he did for us. Do you believe the report? Let's tell people the report. Verse 6 talks about us. Our spiritual action, our actions and our spiritual status. We are all like sheep have gone astray. All of us. We're all born into sin, shaping in iniquity, Psalm 51. I've heard people say, well, I was born in the church. I was, I've always been saved. No, no, no. Truth be told. Truth be told. Do you believe the report? Because if you say you've always been saved and you don't know the report of all that Jesus did, he bore your sorrows, he bore your griefs, uh, the chastisement of your peace was upon him. You're not saved just because you go to church. You're not... You don't know Jesus just because you attend a Sunday school class. You're not saved because you have a position in the church. You have a title. You're not saved because you have a theological education. You're not saved because... You live in a household where you have food in the refrigerator and you have a good car and etc. You have a good job and you go to college and you have a career. Those things, that's just a quality of life. Doesn't mean that you're spiritually salvaged. The report of Jesus, the account, lets us know what he did so that we could accept him and truly be saved. Do you believe the report? Do you believe the report? Let the truth be told, brothers and sisters. 
our actions and our spiritual status. We are all like sheep gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now notice, Jesus said in John 14, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. The preacher wrote in Proverbs, there is a way that seemeth right unto every man. But what is the end thereof? So Isaiah says here, we are like sheep gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. Our own way. But where is it leading you? Let the truth be told. Where is your own way leading you? Truth be told. In the Shakespearean play, he said, to thyself be true. We can lie to ourselves. We can deceive ourselves. But what is the end thereof? What about the end thereof? Truth be told. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. This word iniquity, let me just take a few moments and define it. Because it's used here in this passage of scripture multiple times. Bruised for our iniquities. The iniquity of us all. The word iniquity is sin. But it goes deeper. It is sinning against knowledge. So you have knowledge and you just refuse and you reject the truth and you do what you want to do anyway. It is iniquitous. So David said in Psalm 51, verse 5, he said, In sin was I born. We were born in sin. We had nothing to do with that because of Adam's, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And shapen in iniquity, born into sin, two parts. Born into sin, number one, you had, didn't have a choice. But then shapen, shapen, molded in iniquities. So in so many words, we were taught how to do wrong, taught how to steal, taught how to sear our conscience with a hot iron. Let the truth be told. People say, well, the devil made me do it, or this one made me do it, or that one. Did you know it was right? Did you know it was wrong? If you knew it was right and you knew, you knew the difference between right and wrong, then you had a choice to make. You had a choice to make. So this iniquity, this rebellious rejection of doing what's right versus doing what's wrong, Jesus bore that. That iniquity was upon him. Your iniquity, my iniquity. That's the truth of the matter. Hence, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, and we talked about it in Bible study a few weeks ago, Romans road, there is none righteous, no, not one. He said in Judges chapter was 24, the last verse, last chapter, last verse of Romans, there was no king in Israel, and man did that which was right in his own eyes. He did it his own way. The preacher wrote, Twice in Proverbs, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof. So every one of us have a way on how we want to do things, how we want to live. But let's consider the end thereof. And is it iniquitous? God has exposed to us the word of God, the right way to do it. The Holy Spirit speaks to us and challenges us to do it the right way, do the right thing. And do we just refuse? Do we refuse to speak to that individual, to tell them the truth? And because of it's our truth, it's God's truth, and he wants us to relay his truth to that individual that will help them. But God's truth, in our mind, may hurt them because of our relationship with them, because uh, our emotions, our feelings, so I'm, I'm circling back. Our feelings, our emotions. If I tell my child that, it may hurt their feelings. I don't think they can take it. God knows what they can take more than you, mom and dad. But sometimes we withheld the truth. But then on the flip side, we pray, God, work it out. But we withheld the truth. When God said, speak the truth and speak it in love. Notice that, Ephesians chapter 4. He didn't say just tell the truth because the truth is, can be offensive. 
The truth hurts the flesh. The truth exposes. The truth brings to light, right? The truth makes people accountable and responsible. But the truth also brings assurance. It also brings salvation, affirmation, and confirmation. It makes free. So there's positives, and then there are what we view as negatives, as individuals. Well, if I know the truth, I'm going to have to do something. But let me stay ignorant, unlearned, so then, therefore I won't have to be accountable. Truth be told. Let the truth be told. So what Jesus did for us, he bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, with his stripes, we're healed. Look at all the blessings. Look at all the spiritual blessings, which also translate to emotional and psychological blessings in our lives that he's provided for us. Let the truth be told. Verse 7. He goes on and he says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was oppressed and he was afflicted and he didn't open our mouth. Now I want to talk to the Christians. Do we open our mouth on the job, at home, when something is said to us? Even though it's true, well, I don't think they like us. I don't think they like me. I don't think this, and going on and back and forth. Jesus, let the truth be told, he was oppressed. And he was afflicted. And he didn't open his mouth. He was humiliated, brothers and sisters. And he didn't open his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears, and he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, what did he do for us? He kept his mouth closed, and it was for us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, Ooh, for the joy that was set for before him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Tells us to look unto Jesus. So let's look unto Jesus. Let's look unto Isaiah 53. Looking unto Jesus, the author, he was the first one, all that he experienced, Isaiah 53, and the finisher, his resurrection, right? His death, burial, and his resurrection of our faith, our belief our trust, our confidence. So we get this report, and the, the question I have is, do you believe the report? The greatest question. Because he's the author and the finisher of our belief, our faith, our trust, our confidence. The author and finisher of our faith, who what? Who, in, who for the joy that was set before him, what was the joy? Why did Jesus go through Isaiah 53, all that he went through in Isaiah 53? It was because of the joy of your salvation and the joy of my salvation. It was the joy of your eternal life and the joy of my eternal life in and through him that he endured the affliction. He endured, it, it tells us the same words there in Hebrews chapter 12, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured and despised the shame. And now it was set before him, gone on, you can read it. But think about that. Let the truth be told when we talk about Jesus. Yes, I, we want to know and ask the question, are you saved? Mm -hmm. Do you know Jesus? But do you know what he experienced for you? Do you know why he went through it? It's love. It was love. 
He was oppressed. Verse 7, he was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. He was brought to the lamb as a slaughter, as a sheep before, as a shears is dumb, and he opened not his mouth. So as a Christian, we can discipline ourselves with the help of the Holy Spirit when to keep our mouths closed and when to speak. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and judgment. He was also cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken for us. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Let's look at the true report. Do you believe? For all those who will hear this right now and in the future, do you believe this report? Do you believe a man could go through all these things? Do you believe why he went through all these things? He went through and he endured all these things because of his love for us. This is the true report. Do you believe the true report? Do you believe this true report? Not, not limited to God so loved the world. What does that look like? What does that mean? God so loved the world that he gave. Yes, he gave his son. And when he gave his son, his son, Jesus, our savior, subjected himself to everything we read in Isaiah 53. In verse 10, we have the Trinity working on our behalf. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working on our behalf, your behalf, my behalf. That's how much he loves us. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Father to allow the Son to be bruised. He has put him to grief. He has made his soul an offering for sin. Think about it. Think about it. All these things that God has done, it was for us. It was for us. This is the true report. This is the report that needs to be relayed. Jesus even said it in John chapter 12. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men in telling men and women about God loves them. Isaiah 53 shows us in descript, it describes to us in detail how much God loves us. It shows us. It's a manifestation. This chapter is a manifestation of God's eternal love for you and I. Let the truth be told. Let's not just gloss over it and give some little Bible study and vacation Bible school and this and that and hand out candy and let the truth be told. Hollywood is telling their truth on TV. I really believe this is just my opinion. I just thought about it. It came to my mind. The description of all that Jesus went through and all that Jesus experienced on behalf of all men, mankind, I really believe it will change the mindsets and attitudes of men and women and children as it relates to all these shootings that's going on. Jesus, describing Jesus' flesh, Jesus' pain, Jesus' agony, Jesus, all these things he went through for us. That's what man did to man. I believe in my heart that if we can get that report out, if we can tell this account, 
it'll change the tide. But oftentimes we don't want to talk about it. It's too descriptive. It's too graphic. But yet we have all these shootings and all these things happening. Truth be told, the answer for mankind, for the human race, is Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the way is the truth. And if you want to know the truth, I'm the truth. And what is the truth going to produce? Life. I'm the life. I'm the way that you should take in life. I'm the truth. My truth is going to deliver you as you navigate through life. And I'm the life. I'll give you assurance of not just this life that you're living in, which is temporal, X amount of years. I came that you might have eternal life. A very detailed description of God's love and eternal life for you and I. Truth be told, let the truth be told. The greatest question, the most important question ever asked, do you believe the report? The most, for me, the most important question asked, do you believe the report? Not just that Jesus is the Son of God, we've been conditioned and we've been cultured to believe that. But do you believe Isaiah 53 that he experienced all this? Do you understand that it was for you and for me? And that he had to go through all this. He had to experience all this in order for you and I to be saved. Do you believe the report? It's a question, and I think it's a very important question that we can ask, should ask, and follow up questions. Now, do you know this Jesus? Have you allowed this Jesus to save you? For me, those are the follow up questions. Do you believe the report? truth be told. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus, for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness.